a reading from Deuteronomy. See, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey the commandments of the Lord your God that I am commanding you today, by loving the Lord your God, walking in his ways and observing his commandments, decrees and ordinances, then you shall live and become numerous. And the Lord your God will bless you in the land that you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away and you do not hear, but are led astray to bow down to other gods and serve them, I declare to you today that you shall perish. You shall not live long in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. I call heaven and earth to witness against you today that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live, loving the Lord your God, obeying him and holding fast to him. For that means life to you and length of days, so that you may live in the land that the Lord swore to give to your ancestors, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob. Word of God, word of life. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. The Holy Gospel according to Luke. Glory to you, O Lord. Now, large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself, cannot be my disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not first sit down and estimate the cost to see whether or not he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going out to wage war against another king, will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000. If he cannot then, while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. Please be seated. Grace to you and peace from God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace from God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Jesus we encounter in the gospel today is a little bit different than the Jesus we typically encounter uh, in devotionals and in most gospel readings that we hear about. When we read a devotional or uh, get maybe just a little reminder of uh, Christ or God and maybe a news feed or something like that, it's usually something that feels kind of warm, something that feels nice, something that's reinsuring or somewhat uh, like an embrace, kind of a warm blanket that gives us sort of strength for the, for the day, a sense of reassurance, uh, a sense of God's love that's sort of with us and through us uh, no matter what. And typically, those are the stories that we hear about Jesus as well, stories where Jesus comes into the lives of people and offers healing and hope. I bet you can think of a lot of stories where just that happens in Scripture. Jesus, for example, goes to this field, and there are thousands of people there, all of whom are hungry, and so he finds the means to feed them all with a few uh, loaves of fi uh, bread and a few fish. And all are sort of filled, all kind of have that warm feeling that you get after a large meal where you're, you know, a little bit warm and a little bit sleepy and everything is just right. There are those moments where Jesus goes into people's households and heals people's friends and family. He goes into the home of a Roman centurion and heals a daughter that was dying. 
he goes into the house of Mary and Martha and heals Lazarus, who had already died. He goes into a town where there's a man who's filled with all of these demons, thousands of demons, and he frees that man so that he can live a full and joyful and love-filled life. And there are countless stories that aren't recorded in Scripture where Jesus does the same kind of thing, constantly giving new life, constantly giving reassurance, constantly bringing hope and love. If all of those stories about Jesus are stories that bring a sense of warmth and a sense of reassurance, today's gospel reading is more of a cold shower. It's a gospel reading that kind of stands in a stark contrast to the Jesus we all feel like we know, the Jesus that we meet over and over again in moments of struggle, in moments of despair, in moments of heartache. Because this is a Jesus who uses a word that I wasn't actually allowed to say when I was growing up. I was never allowed to say the word hate in our household, so I had to kind of work around it and say, like, well, I really, really, really don't like you, and that kind of thing. (laughs) Hate was one of those banned words that just didn't have a place in our daily family life. And yet here, in the Gospel reading, Jesus uses that exact word in the context of families. And so this last week, I don't usually tell you when I kind of do Bible research, but I did a little sleuthing this uh, week in Scripture because I really wanted to make the case that, well, this word hate doesn't really come up in the Bible all that much, and so there's not too much attention we need to pay to it because, you know, love is uh, so much more powerful and so much uh, more often mentioned, generosity, grace, all of these kinds of things. And, you know, it's true. I mean, love and grace and generosity and all these things are, in fact, mentioned a lot more often in Scripture. Do not be afraid is mentioned hundreds of times in Scripture. But I'm sorry to say hate is also mentioned a lot as well. And uh, I wish that I could come before you and say, ah, there's no place for hate in Scripture. But, in fact, that word is used a few times. And I just want to tell you about a few ways that Jesus uses the word. It turns out that in Jesus' teaching and in Jesus speaking with disciples, he used the word a few times. So, for example, there was a teaching that he gave. Um, He said, you have heard it said to love your neighbor and hate your enemy. He's using it in this way as sort of an example. And then he follows through and he says, ah, but I teach you to love your enemies and care for those who persecute you. So in that moment, I mean, he's using the word, but he's not saying, you know, go hate your enemy. He's saying, don't do that. Stay away from that. He uses the word again when he's trying to describe um, what it's like to serve two masters. And in uh, some of the examples he uses, he might say uh, serving uh, mammon, which is kind of a way to talk about money, and serving God. And he uses this example and says, uh, no servant can serve two masters. Why? Because they'll end up loving the one and hating the other. He's talking about this choice that a servant might have to make in any given situation. There's one way of living, there's another way of living, and just by happenstance, you know, you're going to have to choose. You're going to find you're spending more time in one area than another. He uses it as a warning to his disciples about the life ahead that they will lead. Jesus doesn't beat around the bush when he warns his disciples that it is a difficult thing to follow him, and he tells them that they will be hated for their beliefs. People who don't understand the gospel of Christ, who don't understand the word of God, people who don't get why these disciples would be following Jesus around in the world are going to hate them, and Jesus doesn't want to give them any misunderstanding about what it means to follow him. In fact, he reassures them in uh, Luke, in the Luke version of the Beatitudes, he said, blessed are those, or blessed are you when people hate you, because he knew that there was going to be this dislike, there was going to be this line that just happened to be drawn against other people and these disciples. He also uses it when he talks about evil in the Gospel of John, evil people hate the light, as Jesus says. And he also says that the world hates me because I testify against it. There's this 
distinction that this word hate is used to describe in Scripture, and often it comes up in this distinction between a way that one would hope to live, this way of God, this way of righteousness, this way of love in Christ, and this other way that doesn't quite understand it, doesn't quite make sense of it. There's this line, and as Jesus is sort of searching for a word to use to describe the strongest distinction that he can as he's teaching his disciples about what it means to be a disciple and a follower of Christ, the strongest word he can think of, the strongest line that he can articulate, the greatest sort of proclamation of how difficult it is, and how hard it is, is made with this word, hate. And when he turns to his disciples and invites them, of course, to follow him, he's inviting them to something more than kind of a weekend retreat. He's inviting them to something more than sort of a list of beliefs, a list of rules, a list of questions and answers. He's inviting his disciples into more than simply a call and response or a set uh, number of hymns or a set number of prayers. He's inviting his disciples into a way of life. He's inviting his disciples into a way of life that looks completely different than the way of life they've known before. And if there is any word that he can use to describe the difference between the way of life before and the way of life after, if there's any way that he can describe this attention to God versus attention to any other thing, the word that he uses is this word hate. Now, Jesus doesn't call us to hate each other. I think there are enough passages in Scripture where Jesus, in fact, calls us to love each other, love our neighbor, love our enemy, so that hopefully there isn't any uh, confusion about what it is that Jesus is asking us to do day in and day out. In this passage, when he uses this word, I think he's trying to make a distinction. He's trying to define for us how different it is to live a life of faith and live a life of Christ than it is to live a life outside of all of those promises and all of those moments of trust and all of those moments of hope. Because when it comes to following Jesus, and if you follow Jesus through all of Galilee and through all of the sermons and through all of the crowds and through all of the healings and through all of the feedings, if you follow Jesus all the way up to Jerusalem, and all the way to one of Jesus' last moments, following Jesus doesn't only take you right away to new life and new hope and endless joy. It takes you into the dark places. It takes you into the broken places. And if we follow the way of Jesus, what he advises us about being his follower actually comes true so hated, so disliked, so set apart that he ends up on a cross. Now, the cross for us is a sign of hope, uh, jo hope and joy. When we look at the cross, we see something that is a promise, something that reminds us that in the midst of our darkest moments, there's light and there's hope. In the midst of those moments where we think that there isn't going to be a next moment, there is. When we look at the cross, we see resurrection. But in the time of Jesus' disciples, in the time of Jesus, and in the moments leading up to Jesus' last moment on the cross, it had none of that meaning whatsoever. The cross meant death. It meant an absolute stop. It meant a moment where you no longer existed and everything you believed in and hoped for no longer existed as well. If you were hung up on a cross, it meant that you were hated and that you were disliked and that you were cast away and that everything was over for you. It meant that everything that you had hoped for, everything that you had dreamed of, everything that you had ever wanted was done. But in Christ, the meaning of this cross has changed and been transformed. 
so much so that anything that seemed to have mattered before is completely transformed into a new way of looking at the world and seeing creation and seeing God in the midst of everything we encounter. No more is that a symbol of death. It's a symbol of life. And it is a symbol of life so much that anything else that could be compared to it is a marker of the way away from God. Anything that you would attach yourself to other than God and other than Christ and other than new life is just a distraction. Because this is the way of Jesus. This is the way to new life. Not a straight shot up to the highest, brightest places, but a path that leads through darkness and through difficulty and through danger. A path that takes us into places that we may not want to go into kinds of relationships that may feel dangerous, where we may feel as though our life itself is in danger. But the promise of Christ is that it doesn't end there. Because what we believe is that even in the midst of those darkest moments, even in the midst of that despair, there is God. And there is love and there is light, and there is hope. But the road there is difficult, and Jesus doesn't want anybody to think that it's going to be anything different. And so he wants his disciples to be prepared to know that this thing that he's inviting them to is more than a hobby, more than sort of a a passing distraction, but a way of living and a way of life that's going to end up changing us for the better and for God. There are two other images he uses in the gospel today. He talks about building a tower, and he talks about waging a battle. And he uses these images to try to tell us how matter-of-fact it is to prepare for what we're about to undertake. There are these disciples who think they're ready to go wherever Jesus is going to go, but he wants to make sure that they understand what that cost of discipleship is. And so he says, it's like building a tower, you know. When you or I think about building our towers, we always want to give a little bit of thought to whether or not we can finish the tower. And Jesus says, of course you would do this. Of course you would make sure you have enough resources. Of course you would make sure you have enough bricks because, oh, oh, if you start building a tower and you only get halfway, you're going to be made fun of mercilessly, endlessly by everybody you know. And so make sure that you know what you're getting into before you finish it. He uses this argument, too, of uh, this battle, of waging a battle. If there are two armies and one has 10,000 and one has 20,000, and if you're on the 10,000 side, you're going to want to think a little bit about what you're getting yourself into because if you don't know all the information, you may walk into a situation that you may not walk out of. But when you have a sense of what you're walking into, maybe you can choose a different way, a way of peace, for example, or a way that sort of builds up the lives of those around you rather than one that kind of takes them all down. The same is true of discipleship. Think about what it means. Think about what it takes. And I'm sure you've experienced this in many, many different ways in your life of discipleship as well. Because I'm sure that you've noticed that not every single moment is filled with joy and not every moment of Proclaiming Christ and trusting in new life and living that out day to day is always easy, is always simple, is always the first thing you think of. Sometimes it's the last thing we think about. But Christ wants us to know that that's not where this life of discipleship ends. Because when we're ready to detach ourselves from all those things that would distract us from God, we're able to see through that dark. We're able to see through that despair and see through to a God who is with us all the way. The truth of it is, is 
when we love God, when we keep our eyes fixed on God, when we are constantly imagining ourselves as a part of this body of Christ, the love that Christ has for each of us gets lived out more and more fully in every way that we live our lives. And so, you know, when Jesus says this, hate mother and father business, he only means it also in that sense of if you're only doing it through you and yourself, it doesn't quite measure up. But through God, when our love is empowered by God, when our love is inspired by God, all the other loves of this world are set right and set true. And our love for neighbor and our love for enemy and our love for friend and our love for family is built up all the more by our love for God. And then we get to that Jesus that we've known and loved all this time, that Jesus of warm feelings, that Jesus of reassurance, that Jesus of companionship that we know so well. The cold shower is there to knock us out of being distracted, to get our attention, to notice what may pull us away so that we can reorient ourselves toward God. And so don't be distracted by those dark places and those feelings of despair. And don't be distracted when the life of discipleship becomes difficult because you know what? It was always going to be difficult. But Jesus knew that too. And Jesus knew that he would be with us through it all. So we give thanks that we can trust in a God who is with us and accompanies us through all that is to come. Amen.